nuclear weapons programs. Here you can see the uh, maintenance check on a US B-61 gravity bomb. So the critical question is what are the key elements of designing a successful nuclear weapons program? Nuclear weapons programs are a complex interaction of different technical processes. They're centered around the production of uranium-235 and or plutonium-239. The particular path depends as much on the origins of the nuclear infrastructure in a state as it does about objectives, secrecy, and the availability of materials and technology. So it's not simply an engineering problem, it's a, it's a political problem, which is why uh, you're learning this. This is a chart of the early U.S. nuclear infrastructure program. It starts with ore from the Belgian Congo and Canadian sources, Port Hope and uh, Radium City in the Northwest Territories. The U.S. had a couple of mining sites of their own in different states. And these were sent as uranium oxides from the American and Canadian sources for processing. The Belgian ore went to temporary storage, storage and then were assayed at different locations on those ports and then were also sent to processing. Now in the processing you had some residues that were left over and those waste disposal. Some of the African residues were sent to other locations for storage. Now the uranium hexafluoride was sent on to uranium enrichment at Oak Ridge, Tennessee and the enriched uranium was sent to fabrication facilities. Uranium oxides were sent to the uranium metal manufacturing and assaying at a number of different locations. They went into production reactors and the purex separation process. Here you can see the major U.S. uranium reserves during the Cold War. This map shows some of the leading research laboratories, which were also the large-scale mass production centers for the assembly of the nuclear warheads. Uh, these include the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, the Sandia National Laboratories, the Los Alamos National Laboratory, and you've got the Kansas City plant, the Y-12 National Security Complex, and the Savannah River National Laboratory. You can see here the Nevada test site, not far from Las Vegas. Well, here's a list of different technical paths chosen by different countries. So the U.S. chose the uranium and the plutonium path because they were unsure of the technology and because the U.S. had a lot of resources. So it basically explored almost every single avenue and almost sing, uh, every single weapons uh, design. Now Japan, which had a nuclear weapons uh, program that was a very, very uh, preliminary, uh, followed uh, uranium because they had availability via the thermal diffusion method. Uh, the Soviet Union went with uranium initially because of political bias against scientific flexibility, so it was decided by the higher-ups. The British went with plutonium uh, because they estimated it was, a, it was uh, a lower cost than a uranium program. Uh, essentially, plutonium could come from an energy program. Uh, France pursued plutonium because of uranium scarcity. You need less fissile material if you're doing a plutonium program. And plutonium was reusable. Uh, initially, China pursued uranium uh, because of the availability of equipment after the Sino-Soviet split. The Soviets had provided a lot of the technology and the training. Israel followed the plutonium route because of their dependence on the provision of France's uh, uh, nuclear reactor, which was built at Demona, and because of France's own preference for plutonium. Uh, India pursued a parallel uranium and plutonium program because of civilian energy needs. South Africa's bomb uh, 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 had to go the uranium route because they couldn't test the plutonium bomb, which is much more complex. And uh, South Africa provided uranium for world exports. Now, initially, Pakistan pursued a plutonium preference, um, but when centrifuge technology became available, they went the uranium route. Now, Brazil uh, has gone the enriched uranium route because uh, their initial focus was on naval reactors. I tried to go to Brazil to do a research project on their naval reactors, and it's the only country where I've been refused a research visa. 
Uh, Argentina initially uh, pursued uranium because they had uranium mines, but then they shifted over to plutonium because they thought it would work better with their civilian research, uh, 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 civilian energy program. Iraq pursued the enriched uranium because they thought it was easier to hide after the Iranians and the Israelis blew up the Osirak reactor and some unknown um, uh, 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 spies blew up the Tammuz uh, reactor in France. Um, North uh, Korea uh, pursued the plutonium route because they had availability of reactors, but subsequently they got uh, centrifuge technology from Pakistan and also uh, pursued the uranium route. Iran uh, followed the enriched uranium route because it was easier to hide the centrifuges um, from agencies. So the first step uh, is uh, to get resources for weapons grade uranium and plutonium. So you would start with a uranium deposit, such as a mine or imported uranium. These are countries with known recoverable reserves of uranium. Now when we say recoverable, we mean you specify uh, the amount of money you're willing to pay to extract a certain quantity, and then you look for the reserves that fit within that range. You, you, could, you could certainly spend a trillion dollars sending a spaceship to Mars or to the asteroid belt and pick up some uranium and bring it back. So recoverable recoverable means within a certain uh, amount of money. It doesn't mean that that's the limit of the reserves. It means that's the limit of the economically recoverable reserves. So we're, we're setting here the value at uh, 80 US dollars a kilo for extracted uranium. Uh, where actually the current price uh, is about 20 US dollars a kilo. Um, uh, uranium ore is actually very inexpensive. It's cheap. Uh, but you can't simply dig it up yourself. You require a license, even in a place like Canada. And acquiring the license is a complex process. There's a peculiar overrepresentation of Korean and Japanese companies um, that are doing our uh, uranium mining. Rather, they disproportionately own the shares in the company that do that. And it's possibly because of technological uh, interest. So you're looking at Australia at the top. Australia has vast quantities of uranium, followed by Kazakhstan than Canada. Canada's got 14% of recoverable uranium. Uh, South Africa, uh, then Namibia, Brazil, the Russian Federation has a lot, the US, Uzbekistan, and then you're, you know, you're looking at countries like China that don't have that much. Um, and I was always curious where they get it. So they obviously have a small supply and they shepherd that supply very carefully. Um, you can see here a picture of a typical um, uranium mine set up to its various processes that I'm not going to take you through, but it, it essentially consists of getting the ore and uh, mixing it with cyanide and other chemicals to get it to separate from the, um, uh, to get the uranium to separate from the other ores that it's typically um, uh, mixed with. Now, Canada provided uranium for military use to the US and the UK until 1965, and domestic reasons we, we wanted not to uh, continue that process. In 1955, there were 925 uranium mines in the U.S. So you're not always looking at uh, very large seams. You could have uh, local pockets uh, that would then be mined out. Uh, you can see a picture here of a typical uranium uh, ore. I mean, it's, it's sort of this silvery metal. But of course, most of the elements on the periodic table are classified as metals, and they look silvery. So it's not not uncommon. So you can see uh, those few countries account for 91% of the known recoverable uh, reserves. Here you can see a worldwide uranium production up until um, up until about 20 years ago. The, and and it, it, there's not much difference here. You do have a burst of growth of reactor constructions in China, India, and other uh, countries in um, the Pacific Rim, but mostly China. Uh, China scaled it back after uh, Fukushima, but the essential message is this, which is not that many reactors are being built, and there's not a lot of demand for uranium ore as a consequence, because reactors don't consume a lot. So it's not an economical business, even if it is a militarily uh, strategic uh, resource. Uh, here, uh, again, you can see um, uh, in detail in the different years the amount of ore that was mined out, uranium ore that was mi mined out in uh, different uh, uh, countries in the world from Zambia to uh, Canada. Canada extracted, in fact Canada and the United States extracted the most uranium in the pre-2002 uh, time period, which is curious. 
again, another representation of where the uranium is in the world. Uh, a lot in South Africa, Mongolia, Kazakhstan. Uh, and uranium, you know, it, it could matter uh, if you needed a lot of it to build nuclear weapons. Uh, Israel became dependent on South Africa for its supply, and it's, it's a question now, uh, where could Israel get more uh, uranium? This is Canada's uh, infrastructure. Uh, we used to have Jean Tilly II in Quebec, um, basically to the east of Montreal, but that site was shut down. So we're basically left uh, with um, uh, Port Hope uh, on Toronto. There's an energy uh, reactor. Canada is one of the leading producers of, of um, isotopes for medical use um, that I talked about earlier. Now you can see our uranium mines uh, up in Saskatchewan, the Northwest Territories, as well as former mines in other areas. And this is an even more detailed map showing uh, some of the uh, research reactors. We have, let's see, research reactors in the University of Alberta. Um, the Saskatchewan Research Council has one. Uh, let's see, you have AECL. Uh, they have a reactor. That's nice. McMaster has one. Well, that's great. University of Toronto. Well, okay. Uh, Royal Military College has one. Another uh, AECL uh Chalk River Laboratories has a number of them. Some of them are being decommissioned. Um, there's MNDS Nordion that has one. Ecole uh, Polytechnique has one. And Dalhousie University has one. And there's also a list of the uranium mounds. And of course, there are the Kandu reactors um, that are located in uh, different areas. Uh, yeah, so yeah. Jean Tilly 1 was a Kandu reactor. So step two is the uranium mill. So for, pro for processing natural uranium into enrichable ore into a uranium oxide concentrate or yellow cake. So yellow cake is uh, when you get this very concentrated uranium oxide. It's mixed uh, in with another uh, chemical to create a compound. Now although uranium ore, uh, uranium-238, costs about $20 a kilo, its covert acquisition and covert processing, of course, is a lot more expensive because you have to hide it and smuggle it. So here you can see the chart on how to make uh, yellow cake. And it's, of course, an involved uh, chemical process which requires a whole separate uh, facility. The most recent price available for yellow cake, and this is, this is a price I found in 2008, which is a while back, was $59 a pound. And this was down from a high of $130 per pound for 2007. So you're looking at a, uh, uh, basically a six, seven fold increase in price at most, or a threefold increase in price from the ore. So it's a more expensive process, but it's still very cheap, right? Um, converting the ore to yellow cake is not, uh, is, is not inaccessible to a developing country. Now, step three is the conversion plant. And what this does is it, it purifies the, um, uh, or takes the, the, the yellow cake that's purified and converts it into a gas. And this is called uranium hexafluoride, or UF6. Uh, you can also convert it into uranium tetrachloride, which is UCL4, another type of gas. Uh, so for this, you need um, a, a conversion plant. And then this gas is then sent on to an enrichment plant. And you, you're going to see why it has to be in gas form. This here is US General Leslie Groves. He was an army engineer. Uh, he built the Pentagon and was subsequently responsible for the entire Manhattan Project. So he had to um, arrange everything from the security to the engineers, the physicists, the primary materials, and ultimately the deployment of the device uh, to the um, U.S. Army Air Force. Here you can see a, a French container of UF-6. So now we're going to explain the seven methods of uranium isotope separation. And it's technical, but it's also, you'll see, very, very political because choices are made and the different systems have different vulnerabilities to intervention and detection. And so when a country is going from a non-nuclear to a nuclear state, it wants to do it as stealthily as possible so it's not stopped. So let's explore these seven methods. Now, natural uranium ore must be enriched from 0.711%, uh, which is um, uh, the, uh, the proportion of uranium-235 in uranium-238, and needs to be increased up to 
3 to 20 percent if you want to use it in a nuclear reactor, or over 93 percent if you want it to be weapons grade. So uranium-235 is always present uh, because of the way uh, that it decays into uranium-238, but it's a small proportion, although a pretty constant proportion. Now, enrichment is measured in terms of SWOOs. These are called separative work units in kilograms. Uh, it's a unit of measurement of the work needed to enrich uranium to a given level, right? and it's not a constant rate. Enrichment costs are related to electrical energy used. This is just conventional because we have a, a, a sort of a general standard uh, set of techniques that are used, and so we have known amount of electricity to make the certain conversions. Different enrichment methods use different quantities of energy per swoop, and we're going to explore that. You can see here the, uh, the, the equation, a swoop is equal to, um, well, certain variables and constants. So the basic logic is you specify the tailings, which is the purity of the remaining slag of the uranium, and that's very often 2%. And then you specify the final product enrichment. And then the outputs are going to be SWU in kilogram and the feed to product ratio. And you can see that in the chart on the right, where you've got the product percentage of uranium-235, how many SWUs it takes. And you'll see it actually um, grows very quickly. Um, uh, it, it takes a lot of energy to get it to 98%. And it also shows you the feed uh, product. Now, um, and this is with a 2% tailing, this particular, uh, particular chart. Now, we can see at the bottom a milled natural uranium. And again, it's silvery metal. All right, and this could be uranium-235, which means it's going to be radioactive. Now, in the map, we see in 2007 the world enrichment capacity. Okay? So, um, uh, you have... Uh, the, the essential capacity of a country, uh, which is going to be uh, in red, and the outer circle is the total capacity. And so uh, the white area is the imported SWOOs for uh, domestic nuclear reactor uh, programs. So the Americans have a substantial amount of enrichment. Um, Russia does as well, um, but they seem to have a lot available for exports. So this is obviously a post-Cold War chart. You can see India and China have a, have a, a pretty large capacity, although India has a much larger and, and has had for decades a much larger energy, energy program than China. China's energy program has been quite small, and most of their capacity has been directed for nuclear weapons. Um, countries of note, uh, Brazil has a very strong capacity. Japan is just wildly disproportionate uh, for the fact that it has no nuclear weapons, but it was, until Fukushima, heavily dependent on um, nuclear reactors for energy. Europe is the same thing. Uh, they're, they're becoming more ambivalent, ambivalent about nuclear reactors. And Canada's got a respectable capacity as well, as does South Africa. Technique number one, the gaseous diffusion method. Currently, it's the most widely used method of uranium isotope separation. Over 50% of the world's enrichment capacity is this method. Now, it was developed originally for neon isotope separation in 1920. So you take hex, the uranium hexafluoride gas, the gas I showed you earlier that's uh, contained in those containers, and you force it through a selectively and microscopically porous barrier. Each of the holes is one millionth of an inch in diameter. Now the lighter uranium-235, it's lighter because of course it's got fewer neutrons, the, the, the number of protons, the atomic number of course is identical with uranium-235, uranium-235 and uranium-238, they have the same number of protons, it's just the number of neutrons that varies by a total of three, right, uranium-238 to uranium-235. So uranium-235, which is lighter because it's smaller, more easily passes through the barrier, and there's a 4% difference every time you squeeze through the uranium hexafluoride gas, you get 4% uh, more uh, uranium-235 than you get uranium-238. So you have to put this not through one layer, but multiple layers, and we call that a cascade. In fact, you have to repeat the process 1,400 times to generate uranium-235 at 4% enrichment. And then you can do it 4,000 more times to bring it to 90% enrichment. And it has to do with the logic of repeating that 4% passage uh, through the barrier. So there's a lot of activity, a lot of passing through barriers. Uh, as absurd as it sounds, the lower left picture is a picture I took of one of these barriers, and uh, it's basically um, unrecognizable. It's like a piece of metal with dots in it. 
Now you can see the graph at the top. What it shows is you uh, bring the feed in from the left of the uranium-238 and the uranium-235. You push it through under pressure. You have a membrane, which is where you have this porous metal. And uh, uh, you have the um, feed continue on, and you have a higher likelihood of the uranium-235 then coming out uh, into the, uh, through the, uh, the membrane into the outer shell, and then it's sort of brought out. But uh, this graphic wildly exaggerates how easy it is to do. You can see uh, the smaller uranium-235 um, uh, is, is uh, wildly overrepresented as having passed through the filter. So this is what a cascade looks like. This is from the Department of Energy. And you can see each of these tanks, and each of these tanks contains the uh, barrier uh, through which the, um, the, the two gases are separated. And these are connected together in a logical structure that's actually a cascade. So you're going to have a lot of these machines set up next to each other uh, in a, sort of a hierarchical structure um, where you're going to keep passing the gas through and then sending it back and then passing it through and separating up and um, combining together those amounts that have similar levels of separation and then you know, keep continually moving them through. Uh, how big are these devices? Let's take a look. They're absolutely enormous. Um, this is the um, a gaseous diffusion process inside a plant. And so some of the largest industrial plants in the world were gaseous diffusion plants. And you can see the very small humans at the bottom. And each of these uh, is just one of the devices in a cascade. So and remember, this is um, uranium gas. So it's a very, very heavy metal rendered into a gas. So you're dealing with actually very, very small quantities. But this is the process you have to go through in order to separate the two different isotopes. Uh, this here is the uh, U.S. Paducah gaseous diffusion plant. Um, it's now been uh, dismantled. And this is the uh, U.S. K-25 Oak Ridge gaseous diffusion plant uh, around the time of the uh, uh, Manhattan Project. So now we can assess this particular technique. It's the most common technique. The enrichment quality is mid-levels of enrichment after an intensive process of repetition. The estimated relative cost is low, um, although the plant itself is very, very expensive. The relative technological complexity is low, which is why it was, it's the, the, the principal technique that was used by the US, starting with the Manhattan Project. Human capital requirements, are, again, are low. You just have these barriers that you have to somehow engineer. Um, it draws from dual-use technologies because uh, most of the commercial capacity uh, uses this. The energy requirements, however, are not small. It takes about 2,400 to 2,500 uh, kilowatt hours per SWU. And I've read an estimate that was 2,300 to 3,000. So there's a range, and of course there are different values. The production requirements is you need a very large plant, uh, a lot of energy, and it's a very long process. The detectability is high because you have these very large plants and of the very high energy consumption. So if you have a factory that you don't know what it produces and a large energy facility nearby, coal or a gas or, or hydroelectric, then it definitely raises questions about what's going on in that facility. The prevailing use is 50%, 57% of the world's enrichment capacity. That's a lot. An early sample facility was the K-25 plant at Oak Ridge in Tennessee, which was a part of the Manhattan Project, and the current sample facility is the USEX Paducah plant in Kentucky. Technique number two, the ultra centrifuge or gas centrifuge technique. Now this enriches uranium by spinning a cylinder at 70,000 rounds per minute. And inside you'd have the uranium hexafluoride gas, the UF6 gas, in the cylinder and it's rotating at this very high speed. Now the centrifugal force pushes the heavier molecules of uranium-238 to accumulate on the outer wall of the bowl, while the lighter molecules of uranium-235 are pushed by the uranium-238 into the center of the cylinder, and there they're sucked out. Now this technique is more efficient. In fact, because it's spinning and you can spin on inertia, it uses only 10% of the energy requirements of gaseous diffusion, but it's a lot more sophisticated technically because uh, if you're spinning at 70,000 RPMs, you've got major problems with friction and you have to keep the centrifuges balanced. 
Uh, now this method produced uh, the 60 kilograms of the uranium-235 for the 12.5 kiloton little boy bomb dropped on Hiroshima. It's used by Pakistan, North Korea, and Russia. Uh, Brazil builds theirs over free floating magnets, and this has become uh, pretty common today. Most countries now do that. So here's a graphic representation of it. You can see uh, you've got feed coming in uh, from the top, it goes in, and then you've got this uh, high speed spin, and then the um, uh, depleted UF6 is pulled out from the sides, and the, you have the uh, uranium 235 uh, basically pushed to the center. And you can see a sort of a more complicated, uh, perhaps engineering faithful structure uh, on the right side graphic. Here you can see some um, centrifuges, uh, gas uh, ultra centrifuges that uh, spin. They're, they're not very large. Um, you can keep them in your basement. Uh, here is a display of centrifuges in Iran. And there's a lot of discussion about an attack on these by Stuxnet, which was a Israeli-American uh, code that was implemented in uh, control machines uh, manufactured by Siemens and some Iran got them and it damaged a lot of the centrifuges. I'm, I'm, you know, I believe that an attempt was made because the, the uh, software was found. The virus that controls these control devices were found, but I'm still skeptical that it caused the scale of damage um, that it ultimately did. And it might have just been a typical public diplomacy to try to make the Iranians feel a little bit insecure. This here is the uh, first centrifuge um, used for uh, gaseous uranium uh, separation. That was uh, in Germany in 1942. The German nuclear weapons program, as you'll see when you read my book, didn't get very far because it didn't have backing and because the time horizon Adolf Hitler had for terminating the war basically marginalized the program as something that would be uh, strategically uh, useful. And Germany was um, uh, had scarce resources and so this was not a program that got support. This is the Iraqi uh, Reshdia plant, where Saddam Hussein had his gaseous centrifuge plant. And of course the centrifuges were seized and removed by the uh, United Nations, the um, International Atomic uh, Energy Agency, when they did their inspections at the conclusion of the uh, 1991 war. So how do we assess this program? Well, the enrichment quality is medium. It's better than um, uh, uh, pushing gas through a barrier in, in the gaseous diffusion technique. It's got a medium relative cost as a consequence. Now, it used to be high technology, but today it requires mid-technological requirements for both uh, the technology and human capital. It's drawn from dual-use technologies because there is a substantial uh, commercial use of it. The energy requirements are substantially lower. I've read as low as 60 to 50 to 60 kilowatts per SWU, also 100 to 300 um, uh, uh, hours per SWU. It's 2 to 10 percent of gaseous diffusion. The production requirements are flexible. You don't have to have a huge factory with these. You can have these uh, modularly set up in basements or hidden in bunkers, uh, which is what the uh, the Iranians have done in Natanz. They've, they've got this underground cave, a bunker system, in which they've got their, uh, their um, uh, centrifuges. So um, you can also turn them off and turn them on. It's timely, energy efficient. Now the detectability is low because um, um, they can be dispersed, but when you're spinning metal that quickly, you actually generate a radio frequency signature which could be detected by, say, a reconnaissance aircraft or a, a reconnaissance drone. Well, it's the second most common global technique for uranium enrichment. Uh, an early sample facility, of course, was um, in 1903, um, a machine was designed. Uh, but it wasn't for uh, uranium separation. And in World War II, of course, the Germans were the first to uh, come up with uh, this device. Subsequently, of course, the Americans did the same. It wasn't, it wasn't a secret technology. It was a technology that, that was available, but just hadn't been applied to um, separating uranium hexafluoride. Uh, a current sample facility would be, for, for example, the Russian Federation plant at Seviskor, and the Iranians have a facility in the Tanz. The third technique is EMIS, electromagnetic isotope separation. Here, ionized uranium atoms are sent past powerful magnets called calutrons to separate uranium-235 from uranium-238. It consumes huge amounts of energy. It's very expensive because of the materials, these giant magnets, and it suffers from significant leakage into the machine parts of the errant uranium-235. But it's relatively technologically simple. 
Uh, there was, in the 1980s, an issue of customs officials in Europe blocking the sale of giant calutrons to Iraq because Iraq was accused of using it for a prospective nuclear weapons program, and it turned out the European um, exporter inspectors were right. Uh, Iraq spent $4 billion on this enrichment method alone. Now, these, these uh, magnets are enormous. I mean, if you look at the picture on the bottom left, uh, you've got there um, a superconducting magnetic solenoid, and on the right you've got the ion portion of the uh, MS. It's really just huge devices. Everything is huge when you're dealing with uh, nuclear nuclear uh, production. Uh, here's a graph um, which represents the U.S. Oak Ridge uh, Y12 MS. So it's the device that they used at that facility. Here's the actual facility at uh, U.S. Oak Ridge. These are giant magnets that are separating um, the uranium-235 from the uranium-238 because of some uh, difference in uh, the magnetic influence between um, those two isotopes. The U.S. Manhattan Project basically did a broad front attack on the problem and with, with enormous resources available they basically exploited um, all of the techniques that were technologically available. And you'll see later the steps by which um, these different systems were put together um, in sort of a chain. This is the uh, Ibn Sina company in Tarmia, which hosted uh, or was going to host the calutrons that the Iraqis were um, uh, trying to import. This is the actual Emmis inside the Iraqi uh, Tarmia plant. So how do we assess it? It produces very high quality, um, but it's very slow. It's got very high relative cost because you've got these giant magnets. But again, medium technological requirements, medium human capital requirements. Um, it's not really drawn from dual use. It's really got experimental Jewish dual use applications. The Americans used it in Manhattan. Um, so uh, it's exploited, but there's not a lot of commercial use for this. The energy requirements are high, just like gaseous diffusion. You're looking at 3,800 um, kilowatt swoos. It's because you're basically creating a giant magnet and requires a lot of power. The production requirements are variable, uh, but the production runs are long. Uh, the detectability is medium, and again, it's, it's because it consumes a high amount of energy. So you've got a plant doing something, and then you've got all these wires going into it from a local energy uh, producing facility. The prevailing use is research use, uh, because it's not cost effective commercially. The early sample facility was at Y12 at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, uh, part of the Manhattan Project. And again, uh, the Tarmia Industrial Center was a, was a current uh, well, not today, but it was a recent facility. Technique number four, liquid thermal diffusion. This uses the transfer of heat across a thin liquid or gas to use convection, and convection is basically rotating hot air uh, or, or um, gas, to force lighter uranium-235 atoms to the top and heavier uranium-238 atoms to collect at the bottom. This system is technically simple. It has low capital costs, but high energy consumption. It is very economical at low levels of enrichment when you're looking around 1%, when you're trying to get stuff that's sort of less than 1% up to 1% and around that level. Um, so it is a part of the uh, process and normally is a feeder, the initial feeder into uh, other processes. So this is a, a, a graphic determine, a, a representation of the uh, convection current and where the uranium-235 goes and where the uranium-238 goes, again, between a cold and a hot wall. And you're able to separate um, uh, using some scientific principle I'm not familiar with. Um, I know my stove can do convection. I, I wouldn't separate uranium in my kitchen, though. So the enrichment quality, uh, it's medium quality and uh, very slow. Uh, estimated relative cost is low, um, but it's got a very high energy cost. Again, it's low technological requirements with regard to human um, capital and the technology required. Um, it's experimental again. There's not that much um, dual use application. Uh, it has enormous requirements. It's 140 times the energy that, uh, of gaseous diffusion. You're basically running an oven with uranium inside it. it. It's huge amounts of energy. It requires a very large plant size and it takes a long time, long uh, production run. It's very detectable, again, because you have a large plant with a large amount of energy requirement. It's, it's not heavily used right now uh, because it's not uh, commercially very helpful. The early sample facility was at S50 plant at Oak Ridge, Tennessee as a part of the Manhattan Project. And, and again, Saddam Hussein 
uh, had, a, had a smaller version at the Tormia Industrial Center in Iraq. Technique number five, the jet nozzle design isotope separation method. This is also called the helicon. It uses an aerodynamically uh, uh, a separation technique in a vortex cube in which the centrifugal forces induce a separation between the heavier uranium-238, uh, which clings to the uh, wall, and the lighter uranium-235, which is pushed to the center and then cut off and, and separated at a tapered exit. What does that mean? You're firing, you're, you're throwing uranium into a jet engine and then you're making it go around a corner so the heavier uranium-238 goes to the outside and you're sitting on the inside with a razor blade uh, recuperating the uranium-235. So uh, it requires large amounts of energy and electricity because you're basically operating a jet engine. It's not commercially competitive and has very high technical requirements. It was developed in Germany, South Africa, and Brazil. So, you know, I, I thought um, the uh, plant uh, in Brazil, which is associated with uh, Navy research to create nuclear reactors for their submarines, and was also associated with Brazil's interest in nuclear weapons in the 1980s when the military government was there, that's what I wanted to investigate. Um, but I never had the chance. So here you can see a graphic of how this would work, but it doesn't really tell us much. Let's take a, a better look. So here you can see on the uh, extreme uh, left, you have this foil, all right? You, and you can see the, sort of the, the razor blades um, through which uh, you've got the uranium-235 recuperated from the gas. In the center, you've got there a graph of the, uh, where, where uh, um, into this process, the uranium is, is pushed, and then you've got the separation at the other end between the uranium-238 um, uh, and, and the lighter uranium-235. Uh, Here you can see uh, the plant in Germany at Karlsruhe, the separation tube containing nozzles being inserted into a tank. And again, you can see another version of that machine uh, in uh, Germany, Karlsruhe. So there's you know, a lot of questions about how the technology got from Germany to South Africa and Germany to Brazil. There's a large presence in Sao Paulo, Brazil of Germans uh, who I've met and who I, I worked with before I got refused uh, my visa to Brazil. And uh, Germans have had a long, uh, a long history of sympathy for um, the Afrikaners of South Africa. So how do we assess this uh, system? Well, the enrichment quality is medium to high. The estimated relative cost can, is, is sort of medium relative capital cost, but high energy cost, because you're operating a jet engine. High technological requirements, because the stresses are enormous. So you have to have a very, uh, very resistant materials in construction. Uh, so for that, you need high levels of uh, skill in the human capital. It's got little commercial application, um, although, of course, the Brazilians and the South Africans and the Germans were pushing it large electrical requirements, 3,000 to 3,500 um, uh, 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 kilowatt hours per swoop. The production requirements are a medium plant size and you have to have the appropriate chemicals available. The detectability is high because of the high energy requirements and the enormous heat that's generated. Little prevailing use because there's just not much use in, in the commercial sector. The early sample facility was at Karlsruhe in uh, Germany. The current sample facility is at uh, Valendaba in the uh, Republic of South Africa, but this was uh, subsequently uh, dismantled. This is the uh, Valendaba nuclear enrichment facility in South Africa. And this is uh, the Advena nuclear warhead plant. And it's called the nuclear warhead plant. It's just a small warehouse. It's not actually a warhead plant. It's simply a plant in the larger uh, South African uh, energy infrastructure. Now the South Africans um, had uh, uh, a lot of scientists with advanced skills at operating energy reactors and so it took basically um, no very few additional resources to assemble a warhead and it's inside this plant uh, inside this plant that uh, South Africa assembled seven nuclear warheads. The seventh wasn't assembled but the first six were and it's completely nondescript. It required very little additional cost. Um, and so uh, nuclear warheads are, are fairly cheap if you already have the personnel in the facilities being used to um, machine 
uh, uranium uh, into rods so you can operate your nuclear reactors. The sixth technique is laser isotope separation. Here you use lasers to separate the uranium isotopes by means of their spectroscopic characteristics. Um, spectroscopic characteristics have to do with the electrons and how they uh, jump between the different orbits around an atom and this is actually detectable and so if you take light you can actually break it up into a rainbow spectrum and these black lines represent those orbits and it allows you at a distance to recognize um, different uh, different elements. So you can look at a, at a star uh, you know, hundreds of millions of light years away and you can then tell up, you can then tell from the spectroscopy the, the ele elemental composition uh, of that, of, of at least on the surface because uh, those elements transmit the um, light energy and it carries with it the elemental signature. Absolutely uh, crazy fascinating. Now what lasers can do is they can be tuned for uh, particular elements and in theory uh, tuned to particular isotopes to ag agitate some and not agitate others and lasers of course are uh, very powerfully concentrated um, photonic energy, light energy, and so you can you can put a lot of energy into something and make it get agitated. So um, the Silex plant uh, variant causes weapons grade uh, uranium to ionize, which is then collected on negatively charged plates. It's obviously very technologically intensive. Uh, you can see here on the left uh, a atomic vapor laser isotope separation process, and on the right the molecular laser isotope separation. Uh, process. This is an advertisement on the uh, from the website of U.S. Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory of their prototype laser isotope separator. Now, uh, if this was really working, people would advertise less, but the Israelis and the Americans and a lot of countries advertise this process, and it basically tells you that um, it's not working, and what they're looking for is research funds, and so would someone please give them some money? So how do we assess this technique? Well, the enrichment quality is very high. Uh, um, the estimated relative uh, cost is low, um, but you need to have high human capital and high technical investment. Um, uh, there's only currently experimental uh, application. Um, it's not even military application. The energy requirements are, again, this is an estimate of 100 kilowatts uh, uh, per hour per swoo. The problem is, uh, you know, it generates heat to make the spectroscopic agitation, probably it would end up taking a lot of energy, so it's a low estimate. The production requirements are that it requires a small plant with, and would probably produce high output, almost immediate output. Its detectability, uh, however, um, is possible through radio frequency analysis. The laser can um, uh, create waves that are detectable at, at a distance. Prevailing uh, use is little, uh, because it's complicated, and I'm not sure anyone actually has one working. Uh, there are, are, are alleged uh, U.S. and Israeli prototypes. Um, there's a sample facility that the Australians claim they have working, a Silex, and the South Africans say they have a commercial prototype, which means they don't have a, commercial, uh, a commercially operating system. The seventh technique is chemical method of isotope separation. Now this uses a variety of chemical exchange processes passed through a pulse column for isotope, isotopic separation. It relies on quantum theory of molecular bonds. Specifically, it takes advantage of how different isotopes of uranium interact with oxygen differently. Uh, and you can see here the French Tricastin enrichment plant. The French use this chemical method and they term it uh, Chemex. Um, and you can see here the ion exchange modules that are part of that whole technique. So how do we assess this technique? Well, it produces medium quality, uh, it's medium relative capital cost, medium uh, technological requirements, but apparently requires high human capital requirements. It's drawn from um, uh, dual use technologies, but it, it's, it's, it's really only experimental at this point, although the French have limited, limited uh, civilian energy applications. The energy requirements are less than gaseous diffusion. And I've heard one. I've read one claim, which is eight, uh, rather six hundred kilowatt kilowatt uh, um, uh, uh, hours per swoop. But um, and I'm wondering if that's not a, a low figure to to try to advertise its its efficiency because it's a newer method. Uh, production requirements are unknown. Um, it's probably medium plant size. The detectability again, it's it's about plant size and energy use, which which it depends what the actual energy use is going to be. It's got little prevailing use because of technical complexity and cost. Uh, you have the, the French um, facility and the Japanese apparently have a prototype. 
Um, none are in commercial operation, and I, th I think the, the French plant there is a prototype that, sh that they're exploring to go into um, commercial operation. So these are the seven techniques of um, uh, uh, isotope se separation, and uh, you know, basically uranium enrichment, going from um, a high proportion of uranium-238 and then reconcentrating um, the material into predominantly uranium-235, 20% for a reactor grade and 93% and plus for weapons grade. So during the Manhattan Project, the Americans used different techniques because of uh, the economical way they could use energy. So the first step was uh, to take natural uranium and to put it through a thermal diffusion process. This is the convection process at S50. Uh, then they took uh, the uranium hexafluoride gas and put it through the gaseous diffusion at K25. And that brought it up to 7%. Uh, then they put it through the alpha calutrons that brought it to 15%. And then the beta cal calutrons, uh, both at Y12, that brought it to 90%. So, uh, here there were there was no um, ultra centrifuges. There we're looking here at, at really a ve very dirty processes. There was an American citizen um, who had Zionist sympathies, and he was accused of using a plant that he owned uh, to smuggle to Israel um, uh, uranium. And so um, you know he was charged, and there was a big investigation done, and his plant was examined, and it turned out that. Um, uh, the 10% the of the uranium that was missing was merely stuck in the pipes because it was such a dirty process. And his process was gaseous diffusion, which is the most, most common one. It's just a very, very dirty process. And you have this stuff getting stuck all over the place. Uranium is, of course, uh, radioactive. It's also toxic to humans. And worse still, it's corrosive to equipment. Now, there are some materials that, that, are, that have been found to be reasonably resistant to corrosion. Teflon, which people very often use to put on the um, threads of a pipe um, or, or their hose in the garden before they plug it in to make sure it doesn't leak. Teflon was developed in order um, to not be corrosive and to seal pipes in these plants. So you're looking at a, a pretty, a pretty um, dirty process. So as a general summary, uranium production is 10 times the cost of plutonium production, according to the most, most conventional wisdoms on the topic. But uranium dovetails more easily with an energy infrastructure, like a civilian energy infrastructure. So it can be, it can be uh, set up covertly. The uranium path also requires less overall uranium ore than a plutonium path. Although I have to uh, indicate that uh, I have sources that say the opposite, so it's debated. As well, it's much easier to hide enrichment and reprocessing than a plutonium production in a reactor. Now here at the bottom you can see uh, a uranium-235 uh, pit. So nuclear reactors. Energy reactors can serve as a rationale for uranium mining, conversion, and enrichment. Nuclear reactors are the prerequisite, of course, for uh, producing uh, both plutonium and tritium, and we'll talk about that later. At the bottom, you can see a Chinese uh, DF-31 CSSX X-10 launchers. These are actually mobile uh, intercontinental uh, ballistic missiles that China uses, and these ones are, are ones that are designed to be able to hit the United States. So in 1993, there were 109 power reactors in the U.S., which generated about 20% of the electricity, and the situation is, is still the same now uh, after more than a quarter century. Um, and there's about 400 in the world total. Uh, Europe has uh, most of the world's breeder reactors. Now, breeder reactors we'll talk about uh, later, but it's a very sensitive topic um, because breeder reactors are seen as instruments of proliferation. So we'll see why in a moment. So globally in 2004, there were 1,118 reactors, of which 280 were research reactors, like the ones we read off in Canada. 400 were uh, ship or sub-engines. And uh, like the aircraft carriers, for example, and the ballistic missile submarines, they all have nuclear engines. And 438 were energy and weapons reactors. Here you can see a distribution of the reactors uh, in North America and Europe and uh, India in particular, Japan and China. Uh, and really the large number of reactors in the um, east, eastern part of the United States. The US has a lot of experience building reactors. They were built at a furious pace up until the 1970s. And then, and then uh, production dropped off. Uh, there simply wasn't demand for more reactors because there were so many um, safety requirements. Uh, most utility companies found it cheaper to burn coal 
and uh, simply to put in environmental protection. So a general reactor design, um, reactors produce energy by using a neutron uh, fission in uranium or plutonium uh, contained in insertable fuel rods and to heat a coolant that circulates to drive a turbine which then generates the electricity just like you'd generate um, electricity in a hydro plant by getting water to turn the turbine. Moderators are materials that control the rate of the reaction by either slowing it down for safety reasons or being withdrawn to generate more energy. Carbon is far less effective a moderator, but it's very cheap to produce compared to deuterium. So a lot of countries use uh, carbon as a moderator. Boron is not used as a moderator, but as a neutron absorber to control a reaction. So uh, you can insert it and then it stops the uh, neutrons. Moderators can also be used to slow down neutrons so they can be captured by the atomic nuclei of uranium-235. If you recall, uranium-238 can capture high energy neutrons and uranium-235 can only capture low energy ne uh, neutrons. So you need to control the speed of the neutron for it to be able to sync with the uh, speed of the agitation of the nuclei of the uh, target um, isotope. Now the Chernobyl plant reached uh, 150 times its normal power level before its water, uh, which was its coolant, turned to high pressure steam and blew the plant apart, um, which, which uh, actually temporarily extinguished the nuclear reaction. Uh, 31 people died uh, in that detonation. And this doesn't include, of course, the people that died uh, coming later that, that we covered um, to try to put out the exposed um, uh, radioactive material. So this is basically the, uh, the graph. Here you've got a moderator and it slows down the neutron so it can get into the nucleus of the uranium-235. Uranium-235 fissions, it creates uh, more neutrons and you have another moderator. And so you have moderators that um, uh, uh, basically uh, control the speed and slow down the speed of the um, neutron as well as control rods there which uh, actually completely stop the neutrons and so you don't want a, a reaction to, to get out of control but because the enrichment is so low you're not going to get an, a detonation at 20 percent enrichment of uranium-235 you're just going to have things get very very hot which is which is a danger with uh, nuclear reactors if they don't have their uh, their coolants now nuclear reactors are rated by their electrical energy megawattage this of course is, is important because you you know you use nuclear reactors in the energy sector in order to generate electricity um, now, the thermal me megawattage, which is used for nuclear materials production, is three to five times that value. So if you have a reactor and we know or we can estimate what its electrical energy output is, we then multiply that by three times three or five, depending on its design, and then we can estimate how much uh, plutonium it can generate. And we'll look later at how that would work. So reactors operate between 60 to 85 percent of the time depending on their efficiency in refueling because you have to stop them to pull up the rods and exchange the rods and typically you'll have that um, exchanging of the uh, fissile material every 24 months. The greater the enrichment of the uranium the higher the rate of neutron emission of course. Uh, the higher the rate of uh, fissioning uh, you have the higher rate of energy production so it's desirable to have very high levels of, of uranium. The problem is, uh, of, of uranium-235, the problem is it's a proliferation threat. People think, well, if a country's going for 60% um, rods, uh, it's a little bit suspicious. Are they not gonna end up being diverted for weapons? You can use fuel rods uh, of uranium um, that are converted to plutonium. Uh, and it's sort of a, a, a sort of a complicated process, but it essentially essentially goes this way. You, you take a fuel rod of uranium, you stick it into the reactor, it gets converted to plutonium when it captures a neutron. So neutron um, hitting uranium will turn into plutonium. Because, uh, so if the uranium uh, fuel rod is used to the point of near useful depletion, when its rate of emissions of neutrons is too low to continue its economic use in the reactor, then about 25% of it is usually converted into plutonium. So plutonium is manufactured in a reactor by firing neutrons at uh, uranium. Now of this plutonium, 24% of it is the unstable plutonium-240 that we spoke about before that spontaneously fissions. Um, and that's if you pull the fuel uh, used out um, uh, just when it burns out. And 18% of it uh, was used uh, in a graphite moder moderated reactor. So if you use graphite, um, you're actually going to reduce the amount of plutonium-240. The control of neutron emissions can keep the target blanket of uranium-238 from accumulating more than 6% of plutonium-240. So if a country's um, 
uh, got a lot of uranium and they're firing neutrons at the uranium uh, in a reactor and if they're using a target blanket of uranium-238 or graphite it could be because they're trying to keep the, the, the quantity of plutonium-240 down and this could be an indicator that they're trying uh, to build a nuclear weapon right they're trying to uh, get plutonium-239 with a very low quantity of plutonium-240 so there are six functions of nuclear reactors. The first type is a research reactor. These are, of course, used to develop uh, weapons or energy production technology for training purposes, for nuclear physics experimentation, uh, for producing radioisotopes for uh, medicine and research. They're typically in the one to two megawatt range. Uh, a lot of diff different fissile material models can be fit inside. And uh, they can limit a plutonium burnup by being shut down. They're probably the most versatile for uh, really controlling how much plutonium you can manufacture. But research reactors, by definition, have very low um, rates of production. There are, of course, uh, civilian energy reactors that generate electricity. The energy range is 100 up to 1500 um, megawatts, which, of course, translates into 4500 megawatts thermal, right? If we multiply um, the 1500 by 3. Um, it, you typically have a 5 to 7 percent uh, uranium 235 rod. You need, of course, uh, a cooling engineering, a shielding engineering. Um, so most civilian reactors operate under pressure and therefore cannot be refueled in this mid-course and therefore cannot prevent the burnup of plutonium in a controlled fashion or permit refueling during operation. So you end up with rods that cannot be used for uh, nuclear weapons. There are a variety of designs, uh, water-cooled graphite moderated, boiling light water, pressurized light water, heavy water moderated and cooled. Uh, graphite moderated and helium cooled and liquid metal moderated uh, sort of very complicated um, Canada was the second country in the world to have a reactor after the US when Canada set up its chalk river reactor in uh, 1945 there are production reactors these are designed uh, to make plutonium and tritium efficiently uh, the fissile material would typically be uranium-238, right? This is the uranium-238 that you discarded that is not useful. Uh, it's not use, uh, useful in a in a, in a, as, an, as the um, main material in a, in a fission weapon, but of course it can be used as um, the third stage in a thermonuclear weapon, and it can also be used to create plutonium-239. So uh, you can um, here control more easily in a production reactor because it's entirely designed to generate uh, plutonium. You can severely minimize the amount of plutonium-240 that, that is created in the plutonium-239. Uh, typically the design is a graphite moderated uh, reactor or uh, CO2 or helium cooled. Now breeder reactors um, produce more fissile plutonium than they consume. It's, it's the ultimate perpetual motion machine. It's a, it's, it's a, a process that gives you more, more fissile plutonium than it consumes. It's, it's outrageous. So in the U.S., they've actually made it illegal to export it to other countries, and the U.S. is fairly good about those types of laws. The problem is the Americans were very concerned that the French were, in the 1970s and 80s, desperate to make their own uh, breeder reactors uh, commercially successful. Uh, the French were, were exploring the export of these to different countries that the U.S. thought was um, irresponsible. So there's a lot of controversy in the 70s and 80s. It's estimated to be over 60 times as efficient as a uranium-235 fueled reactor. Uh, it uses fast neutrons to irradiate a uranium-238 blanket from weapons-grade uh, plutonium-239 source. The fuel uh, plutonium-239 generated a lot of plutonium-240 um, uh, you know, if it's obviously not well controlled. You also have propulsion uh, reactors. Uh, submarines and naval ships uh, had these. 20% uh, of the world's reactors ended up at the, um, by the middle of the 1990s on the shores of the Kola Peninsula. And it was, it was a terrible sight to see. The Soviet Navy abandoned hundreds of submarines and ships and just dumped them on the shore while they still had their reactors operating. So you'd have like skeleton crews to make sure there wasn't a meltdown, but there was a lot of concern from the, um, the uh, Scandinavian countries and from any country that, that um, got water from currents that came in, in and out of the Arctic that you'd have uh, an incredible irradiation of that part of the ocean. So there were international efforts, uh, which Canada participated in, 
to bring those ships into dry docks and uh, uh, basically disassemble their reactors and then disassemble the ships in, in an environmentally conscious fashion. And there's actually a documentary on a Discovery Channel which showed Canada participating and being one of the leads on the dismantling of a typhoon ballistic missile submarine in a, dr in a dry dock. And it's really epic and shows you the high level of skill that uh, Canadian engineers have. There are, of course, uh, space reactors and uh, mobile power systems. Uh, typically, these, these use HEU or highly enriched uranium or plutonium-238, uh, which generates a lot of heat and is therefore uh, useful. So these are uh, different reactor designs uh, with some uh, detail as to the different components. Light water reactors. So this is a uh, boiling uh, water reactor graphic. This is a pressurized water reactor. Here you can see a graphic of how that system works. This is a heavy water reactor. Um, this is the design that uh, Canada used for the uh, CANDU reactor, the uh, deuterium uranium uh, system. This is the CANDU reactor, somewhat infamous because you can unfortunately remove the fuel rods while it's still in operation, which means it facilitates covert use of the reactor to try to build nuclear weapons. Every single country that bought a CANDU reactor has broken the IAEA rules, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is a nuclear arms control agency, by sticking out rods and then trying to remove some of the plutonium for laboratory purposes to see if they can build an atomic bomb. This includes India, Pakistan, Romania, uh, Taiwan, and South Korea. So uh, the U.S. Ha has repeatedly uh, shown concern about this reactor. And there was an incident in Canada in which uh, uh, I believe it's Hydro One from Ontario, I'm not sure what they're called, plus Hydro-Quebec. Hydro-Quebec at the time operated the Jean Tilly II reactor, uh, went to Jakarta, Indonesia, and tried to sell to the Indonesian government a CANDU reactor. And the problem was that you had two provincial authorities trying to sell uh, nuclear technology uh, without the permission, and in fact at the time without the knowledge of Energy Canada, which is responsible for licensing that technology abroad. And um, for proliferation reasons, uh, they were very concerned um, that uh, they weren't allowed to find out earlier so they could have blocked the deal. So here's a uh, graphite moderated reactor. And there's a lot of concern because this can produce uh, plutonium. And there are, of course, water-cooled uh, reactors, which um, uh, are actually seen as, as a, a fairly uh, safer. And here you have the uh, fast breeder reactor, which was uh, such a concern uh, of those trying to stop proliferation in the 1970s and 1980s. And here you can see uh, a graph of how a breeder reactor works. Step six, reprocessing. So you use chemical separation, reprocessing, permits the recuperation of traces of unfissioned uranium-235 and plutonium-239 from spent fuel rods. Uranium-235 can be recycled into the enrichment process, whereas plutonium-239 can be incorporated as fuel. Now, usually it'll be too impure because of the plutonium-240 and plutonium-242 to be used as weapons-grade fuel. Large-scale use of uranium is very hard to track because there's a lot of it out there and therefore easy to divert for weaponization purposes. However, spent fuel is hard to reprocess as most of these fuels are foreign-owned and therefore the reactor safeguards and the spent fuels are returned to their source. Japan, for example, has sufficient nuclear material for between 1,000 and 2,000 nuclear weapons. And they have a program that could probably weaponize in a, in a few months. And they have a rocket program that's shifting from liquid to solid fuel rockets, which we looked at earlier. Now, to qualify this, uh, there are some commentators that have argued that the 1,000 to 2,000 uh, nuclear warheads uh, probably would be difficult because the while we're, we have while the Japanese have highly enriched uranium, which is which is almost weapons grade, it's not sufficiently weapons grade. Um, to create um, uh, large detonations. Now, um, this, this scale has been possible 
um, because Ronald Reagan, the American president in the 1980s, uh, to win the support of the Japanese uh, during uh, the Cold War, basically allowed them, licensed them to manufacture their enormous um, reprocessing plant, one of the largest in the world. Um, because at the time the Japanese were committed, uh, obviously, to a uh, civilian energy program, but also because, you know, it's insurance, just in case something um, happens and the Japanese need to be able to build warheads. In addition to that, some of the Japanese reactors rely on uh, Euratom, which is a, a, a joint European company that manages nuclear uh, materials, uh, to provide Japan um, some of the fuel. And when the Japanese are finished with the fuel, they have to send it back to Europe. And so every year or so, a small flotilla of, of, of merchant ships carrying uranium, well, I mean, I mean a small flotilla, I mean one, one ship or maybe two ships, uh, is escorted by a warship, either a Japanese warship or a French warship, as it goes from the Mediterranean uh, to the Indian Ocean onto Japan and then back again. And there are you know, a couple of fiction stories where um, you have uh, militants who seize control of that shipment. So plutonium processing. Plutonium, of course, is not a naturally occurring substance and is created in reactors by having uranium-238 capture a neutron released from a controlled reaction of uranium-235 or plutonium-239, and thereby produces an isotope of plutonium-239, which is called neptunium-239. This beta decays, decays into plutonium-239, and it has a stable half-life of 24,300 years. But it, it doesn't mean you can keep it in a warhead longer than 10 years because of the generation of plutonium-240. So you can see here the steps. It goes from uranium-238 plus a neutron to uranium-239. Uranium-239 uh, um, uh, then uh, decays into neptunium-239 plus a beta particle with a half-life decay of between 23 and 24 minutes. And then neptunium-239 becomes plutonium-239 uh, which releases a beta particle with a half-life decay of 56 hours. So uh, you can see here a picture of um, that process and that graphic with the uh, with the delays in time. This is the uh, U.S. Oak Ridge uh, plutonium breeder reactor. So the basic order of production is again very simple. You start by irradiating a uranium-238 blanket with uranium-235 fuel rod. The uranium-238 is converted into plutonium-239, uh, and this replaces the uranium-235 as the fuel for the reactor, and the uranium-238 blanket can be replaced by the depleted uranium-235 fuel uh, to then produce more plutonium-239. Because of impurities, depleted plutonium-239 fuel rods cannot be put into uh, a neutron capturing blanket. Uh, and here you can see a um, rail gun which was used in the 50s in Europe, not used, but deployed rather, uh, firing a tactical nuclear detonation. And this is actually, it looks like it's a color enhanced photograph of, of, an, actual, of an actual event. So here you can see uh, the steps, uranium-238, uranium-239, neptunium-239, and then plutonium-239 nucleus, the different steps it goes through, and the amount of energy that's released. So for the uh, purposes of nuclear weapons production, reactors can be classified according to three characteristics. Number one, uh, uranium or plutonium fuel. Plutonium fueled reactors require significant technical expertise, but can produce far greater neutron emissions. Breeder reactors fueled by plutonium-239 can be used to generate more plutonium than they consume. Uh, here you can see uh, what is a display of the uh, detonation of the atomic bomb over Hiroshima, and I suspect it is in Hiroshima. This is the Demona plutonium production workstation near Beersheba in Israel, where the Israelis uh, manufactured their plutonium. It was taken by Venunu, who uh, was a janitor there, um, who, for reasons that are not entirely clear, took a bunch of pictures and then went to Europe and showed it to some journalists. And then the Israelis captured him and brought him back and put him in um, a prison and then when his prison sentence entered, he converted to Christianity and then said he would tell everyone about the program. And so the Israelis have incarcerated him um, indefinitely. 
The second characteristic is whether the reactor is a light water or a graphite heavy water moderated reactor. Light water moderated reactors produce less plutonium per uranium fission than graphite and heavy water moderated reactors because the former moderator does not slow the neutrons. For neutrons to be captured by uranium-235, their speed must be slowed by passing them through a moderator. Fast neutrons move at 10,000 miles per second and can fission uranium-238. Now, slow neutrons, uh, these are fast neutrons after collision that does not result in an absorption in a nucleus, such as through water or graphite, can fission uranium-235, but not uranium-238. Uranium-238, capturing a slow neutron, becomes plutonium-239. So, uh, um, you can hit uranium-238 with both, but it depends what you want as the result. This reduces the plutonium impurities, such as plutonium-240, in a target blanket of depleted uranium-238. Weapons-grade plutonium is defined as 93.5% plutonium-239, no more than 67% plutonium-240, 0.07% plutonium-238, and 0.5 to 0.7% plutonium-241. A mean yield of a poor plutonium weapon is 10 kilotons, and a 30% probability of attaining a 20 kiloton range. The third characteristic is online fuel changes or the halting of fissioning. Energy production reactors are far more efficient in design when they cannot have their rods removed in the middle of operations. However, reactors used to produce weapons grade plutonium require removal of the fuel rods and plutonium blanket prior to the end of the burnout of the fuel rods in order to minimize the cumulative impurities of plutonium-240 in the uranium-238 blanket converted into plutonium and the original fuel rods. It is more expensive to separate the plutonium-240 from the plutonium-239 than to get the plutonium-239 from a special purpose reactor in which the fuel rods are removed at the appropriate time. So here you can see a uh, plutonium ring, which is of course going to be subcritical. Um, these are graphs I've taken off the internet at different times and they're very difficult to of course locate because this is um, information no one really wants to share and it basically shows you the rate of the increase of the impurities in plutonium uh, as you leave it uh, being bombarded by uh, neutrons and so um, I'm not sure how to interpret these because I don't know what processes create these um, different ranges, but of course the ultimate goal is to uh, significant, significantly minimize the impurities. So production estimates. For each day of a 100 thermal megawatt, and remember not, not the non-thermal, which is how we rate energy reactors, but the thermal megawatt, which is a, a value that's three to five times, so for each day of 100 thermal megawatt operation by a reactor with uranium-235 of less than 20% enrichment as fuel, you generate 0.9 to 1 gram of plutonium. So the US, for example, uses dedicated production reactors, uh, particularly at the uh, Savannah River site in South Carolina and the Hanford Reservation in Washington. If you recall, the Hanford site is the one that was hit by the Japanese uh, balloon uh, that started a fire in the Second World War. India and North Korea make use of civilian reactors for this, and France, Japan, and Russia make use of breeder reactors. So the plutonium generated by uh, various ra reactors are uh, 5.5 to, 5 .5 to 8 kilograms per year for North Korea's 20 to 30 megawatt thermal Yongbyon reactor, which is uh, moderated by graphite, although the reactor was never fully completed. Um, Israel has a 100 megawatt plus thermal reactor at Demona, moderated by heavy water, and it has an estimated capacity of 40 kilograms per year. So the next technology, of course, and we keep bringing up the same kind of technology, is to use neutron particle accelerators, like these, these vaunted uh, lasers that have never quite been uh, put into, into use, uh, rather than the uranium-235. Um, there have been thoughts about this at CERN, um, but of course, uh, we have no actual prototype. This is the reactor at uh, Yong Beyond. Here you can see the Hanford plutonium uh, production history. Uh, and they manufactured weapons grade uh, for a long time, then into fuel grade, and then when the warheads had to be replaced uh, because plutonium uh, does accumulate plutonium-240 over time, uh, they then went back into the production in the 1980s.
and they periodically go back into production and it causes a little bit of a stir in the uh, leftist anti-nuclear anti-warhead community but you you know if, if you're going to have a nuclear weapon you might as well have it working especially if you paid for it step eight plutonium processing and reprocessing plutonium cannot be chemically separated from its isotopes at the moment so it generally retains the impurities acquired while it's bred in the reactor. Thus, it is important that uranium-238 being converted into plutonium-239 be removed prior to the dangerous accumulation of plutonium-240, and that the rod be chemically separated into its constituent uranium-238 versus plutonium-239 elements. And then you end up with plutonium that keeps the plutonium-240 and other impurities. The blanket rods of uranium-238 and plutonium-239 are usually stored to permit the fissioning out of their product for safe manufacture. They are then dissolved in nitric and sulfuric acid, and the plutonium is chemically separated from other non-plutonium impurities. These different methods are termed purex, butex, and redox. Spent plutonium-239 fuel rods reprocessing does not benefit from much economy of scale, so having a big plant doesn't make much of an, of an advantage. The British Magnox plant reprocesses 1,500 tons a year of spent uranium, and India's Trombe reprocesses 30 tons a year of spent uranium. Uh, again, the, um, the plutonium-239 uh, uh, warhead in the Fat Man bomb dropped on Nagasaki that was supposed to have been dropped on Kakura uh, was only 6.2 uh, grams. So you can sort of calculate out how many days at a therm certain thermal megawattage you need generating a 0 0.9 to 1 gram of plutonium per day to generate that warhead. Here you can see a uh, simplified representation of the Purex process. How to get plutonium to make a plutonium atomic bomb. It goes through the various uh, different uh, technical steps, although hyper simplified. This is the um, plant at Hanford, Washington. And there they do the uh, radiochemical plutonium uh, processing. Step nine, heavy water production. Heavy water requirements um, for making nuclear weapons. There's a requirement for 19 metric tons for India's 40 megawatt thermal Cyrus reactor, uh, 78 metric tons for India's 100 megawatt thermal uh, Druva reactor, more than 36 metric tons for Israel's more than 100 megawatt thermal Damona reactor. So deuterium, H2, its natural rate of occurrence in water that you drink every day is 0.015% of H2O. And it can be extracted using uh, deuterium oxide uh, electrolytically uh, by decomposing it into um, deuterium gas. And this is an experiment you might have seen in your high school experiment where you stick a wire into water and then you separate uh, water into hydrogen and oxygen gases. This is the uh, deuterium electrolysis process that makes this possible. Tritium H3 is a byproduct of the irra ir irradiation of lithium in a reactor or by a neutron accelerator, and tritium is a half-life of 12.5 years. So you've seen this before, but it's lithium 6 plus a neutron ends up being lithium 7. Lithium 7 alpha decays into tritium plus helium-4 um, nuclei and energy, which de decays away in less than a second. And there at the bottom you can see the uh, graph for uh, tritium production. During the Second World War, the uh, Germans were using the Nordsk plant in Norway to generate uh, deuterium. And there's, of course, a famous uh, uh, Hollywood movie and a lot of books on the topic of Norwegian commandos trained by the British who went to the Nordic plant and blew up a ship carrying the uh, deuterium back to Germany because the Allied uh, war effort was heavily focused on the possibility of, of a Nazi atomic bomb. Now ultimately the Nazis didn't put much focus on acquiring nuclear weapons but um, it's been estimated that 50% of the US intelligence effort in the Second World War was focused on Germany's um, nuclear uh, program. Uh, that's the degree of concern there was about Hitler getting an atomic bomb, essentially a device that could be used to destroy cities uh, if Germany had produced enough of the weapons. 
the source of uranium uh, would have been easy for, for uh, Germany. Marie Curie's source of uranium was in Czechoslovakia, Brno, and um, uh, Germany, of course, occupied Czechoslovakia, but they hadn't uh, realized the importance of the material there. So here you can see the average age of a warhead per year, and the, the reason this is important is it's a part of the debate in the U.S. has spent a lot of money uh, refurbishing all of the plutonium warheads. The U.S. has very, very small missile warheads, and it's in large part because almost all of them are plutonium warheads. And so plutonium doesn't have a very long shelf life, and it takes a lot of money to uh, remanufacture the warheads. And this is very uh, difficult to read. I'm not even sure if it's going to appear in, in a sufficiently readable form. But you, if you uh, place your nose very close to the screen, uh, you're going to be able to see the number of warheads going up and then going down for uh, different countries. And you've got uh, Israel there. Um, uh, and was, the estimate for them was that they were building two bombs per year, India, Pakistan, North Korea. And then you've got China, um, which has remarkably few weapons. Um, uh, given its, its uh, aspirations as a global power. Perhaps it's basically being conventionally aggressive by, by provoking all its neighbors, but paradoxically um, doesn't really want to um, uh, threaten other states with nuclear weapons. You've got the UK and France. The UK um, has fewer weapons than France. And uh, you've got Russia, um, which has got a, a rapidly declining uh, arsenal.